This hearing is now called back to order, and we are going to start with our second panel. Um, and I want to, uh, in advance, thank all the witnesses for being here this morning. Uh, our first uh, witness is Ms. Margot Dorfman. Uh, she's the CEO of the U.S. Women's Chamber of Commerce based in Washington, D.C. The chamber represents 500,000 women-owned companies throughout the country. Uh, Ms. Dorfman, you'll have five minutes to make your presentation. Thank you. Congresswoman Velasquez, Ranking Member Shabbat, and members of the House Small Business Committee, thank you again for addressing this very important issue. I'm here again today on behalf of millions of women-owned firms all across America to tell you that the Small Business Administration has once again sabotaged the implementation of the Women's Federal Procurement Program. And to remind you why this program, as Congress originally intended it to be implemented, is so dearly needed. Recently, the SBA filed a new set of proposed rules for the implementation of the Women's Procurement Program. These new rules ignore the recommendations of the scientific and legal experts and render the program of ineffective by limiting its useful to a, use, use to a handful of industries and requiring each and every federal agency to conduct an analysis of the agent's, agency's past procurement activities and make a finding of discrimination by that agency in that particular industry. For years and years, the SBA has hidden behind false pleas for time while women business owners have lost billions of dollars annually. Time to hear from the experts, time to gather the data, and time to understand how to determine women-owned status. But with this last action, they can no longer hide their contemptuous position towards securing fair access to federal contracts for women business owners. The arbitrary and unscientific method they have chosen to select the industries for this program looks more like something pulled out of a hat than the results of seven years of work and of, scientific dis of a scientific disparity study. And the outrageous requirement in every agency con that conducts the studies of discrimination in all industries only shows us how far this administration will go to prevent women from gaining fair access to federal contracts. When Congress first passed the Equity and Contracting for Women Act of 2000, the SBA was to prepare a study to determine industries in which women business owners were underrepresented in federal contracting and establish procedures to ver verify eligibility and participation in a competitive set-aside program. The SBA first undertook this study in-house. After completing their own study, the SBA leadership determined that they needed a study of the study and that they needed experts to tell them how to do the study correctly and how to interpret the data. To this end, the SBA employed the National Research Council of the National Academy of Sciences. The NRC is a prestigious and well-respected institution with regularly employed of, to provide expert advice to the federal government. The NRC established a prestigious steering committee for the project, including the chair of the School of Public Policy and Social Research at the University of California, Los Angeles, and scholars from the Haas and Marshall Schools of Business, the Department of Sociology at Rutgers University, and the School of Law at the University of Virginia. The scientific experts and legal experts carefully framed the requirements for the study through the lens of the legal fra framework of disparity studies and the legal standards of gender preferences. They made a very clear set of recommendations. They recommended using four variables and four tables to show industry groups using a wide view of ready, enable, and a narrow view, and measuring contract actions versus contract dollars. The NRC also clearly stated how they recommended this data to be interpreted. The industries that appear in two or more of the four tables may be deemed underrepresented. Using the NRC recommendations and the RAND data that followed, 87% of all industries should be included as underrepresented in the federal contracting. But nothing is simple, direct, or clear in the hands of the SBA. The SBA threw out the NRC's scholarly recommendations and whittled away possible measurements until they found a narrow selection they liked. Then they tried to move the emphasis from underrepresentation to discrimination and tagged on the incredible requirement that every agency compete, complete a discrimination study in every industry. Again, the SBA has turned years of time and money into a ridiculous circus treat treating the lives of thousands and thousands of American citizens as toys in some political game. 
Trust me, to women business owners, this is no game. Fair access to federal contracts is serious business. The economic and political rise of women in America is truly something for the history books, but the economic realities for women business owners remains very troublesome. Since the paltry 5% goal for contracting with women-owned firms was set in 1994, the federal government has never hit the mark. Even today, as women-owned, 30% of all firms in America, the federal government lags behind in doing business with women. Women lose between five and six billion dollars every year as the federal government fails to meet the low 5% mark. And the openly unsupportive attitude that is exhibited by the SBA only serves to continue a sad tradition of failure within the government contracting ranks. Once again, I ask the House Committee on Small Business to compel the SBA to implement the Equity and Contracting for Women Act of 2000 as intended by Congress seven years ago. It is clear that without this law in place, women-owned firms are losing billions of dollars annually. Women business owners are ready and able to grow their businesses. We ask you to support their growth as they provide for their families and advance the economic growth for their communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dorfman. And now I would like to recognize Mr. Moore from Kansas for the purpose of introducing his constituent, Ms. Farris. There we go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the invitation to be here today, I'm Dennis Moore from 3rd District of Kansas and as a member of the Small Business Committee who's been on leave from the committee since the beginning of 2001, it's great to be back here in the hearing room. I'm here today to introduce my constituent and your next panelist, Denise Ferris. Denise is the founder and managing partner of the Ferris Law Firm, where she practices general business and commercial construction law. She was AV rated by Martindale Hubble, representing the highest peer review ratings for expertise and ethics. Her firm provides legal services related to corporate consultation and formation with special emphasis on women and minority owned small business, including federal contracts and affirmative action, along with risk management and general contract litigation. Denise is a rising star in Kansas City and its surrounding areas with her law practice and experience as a small business owner. During 2007 alone, she was named Woman in Public Policy's Instant Impact Team Leader and awarded their 2007 National Public Policy Award. Kansas City Business Magazine named her among the 50 most influential business women, and the Kansas City Chapter of the National Association of Women Business Owners named her Member of the Year. She's rated uh, by the Missouri Bar Top 25 Presenters. Denise is a frequent speaker and author for various local, regional, and national trade organizations and magazines. She's authored chapters on affirmative action, and uh, Denise has also been a featured presenter for the National Forum of the Construction Industry Annual Meeting, the Association of General Contractors, Bu Builders Associations of Kansas City and Springfield. My staff has another 14 pages of introduction. I'm going to stop right there and, and welcome Denise Ferris. Ms. Ms. Ferris, you will be recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Velasquez, Ranking Member Shabbat, members of the committee, and Congressman Moore. Thank you for coming by. My name is Denise Ferris, and I'm appearing today on behalf of WIP Women Impacting Public Policy and its general membership, which represent over a half a million women business owners nationwide. I own the Ferris Law Firm in Stillwell, Kansas, which sits on the border of Kansas and Missouri. I am a certified WBE company, and I am apparently one of the 55,000 women currently registered in the CCR. I'm a commercial construction lawyer, and for the past 17 years, I've focused on the constitutional parameters of affirmative action in government contracting. I know the committee appreciates how important this proposed rule is to us and to me personally and professionally. I focus my comments today on three aspects of the rule. First, the RAND study, the legal standard applied, and then the flowdown effect. The 2000 law gave the SBA the responsibility to determine in which industries women-owned businesses were underrepresented. The RAND Corporation released its study in 2007 after seven long years of waiting. As discussed earlier in this hearing, the RAND Corporation, per SBA direction, computed disparity ratios for women-owned businesses in four different categories. The RAND study concluded that depending on how the SBA chose to interpret the data, either 80% on the one hand or 0% on the other hand of industries showed a significant disparity for women-owned businesses. 
We believe this indicates some fundamental flaws in the data on which the proposed rule is based, and the Wren study actually admits the own errors in the data. It identifies inaccurate <coughs> NAICS codes, does not analyze the huge disparity variance in the methods, relies on outdated size <coughs> standards, it omits important data such as the entire Department of Defense procurement stats, and it also ignores the effect of multi-year schedule contracts and classifications. In light of these deficiencies, the SBA nonetheless chose the method least supportive of the original legislative intent. Second, we believe the SBA proposed rule applies an incorrect standard of review. Although it says it's applying intermediate scrutiny, it clearly, in fact, has created a new level which goes beyond even strict scrutiny and a level that doesn't currently exist for any other program. For example, under intermediate scrutiny, a government only has to show an important state interest or government interest and a program substantially related to achievement of that interest. This standard has already been met. Specifically, as acknowledged in Public Law 106-554, and the RAND study and the preface to the current Federal Register rule. The government has acknowledged, one, that women-owned businesses are the fastest growing segment of our economy. Number two, that we're growing at twice the rate of the average business in the economy. And three, that despite this fact, since 1994, we have not been able to hit a 5% target in federal procurement. But here, the SBA is actually saying we, knew it, we need a new strict, strict scrutiny standard because we're saying first, despite the law, the program can't be implemented until we've done this seven-year study. And secondly, even after this study has found underrepresentation, we're now requiring a new level that requires each agency to do an additional study before the rule is implemented, and that's the key fact. For example, the 2007 study determined that if you are a woman cabinet maker, you are substantially underrepresented. But before you can justify a set aside, each agency then has to review its discriminatory cabinet making contracting practices before they can justify the set aside. Now, we all know that government moves deliberately and slowly, but quite frankly, under this standard, any contracting opportunity will be gone once these study after study is done. <coughs> Finally, and importantly, this rule has a chilling effect on state and local programs because of this new standard, which effectively kills all gender-related programs. True availability cannot be measured until women business owners are encouraged to register their businesses and their capabilities. The message flows down to women-owned businesses that there is no reason to register because effectively no program will ever survive this standard. We urge the committee to send the SBA back to the drawing board and to investigate why only 55,000 women-owned businesses out of a pool of 10.4 million are currently registered in the CCR. Since it's taken the SBA seven years to get this far, we believe the agency should thoughtfully consider the public comments it receives during the next 60 days. WIP encourages Congress to require the SBA to implement a meaningful women's procurement program, which will actually have a positive effect on women-owned businesses in federal procurement. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Farris. Our next witness is Ms. Beth Gloth. Ms. Gloss is the president of United Materials, a small business in the roofing industry located in Denver, Colorado. Ms. Gloss Company is one of the less than 2% of women business-owned firms in construction. Welcome. Thank you very much. I am Beth Gloss, the managing member of United Materials. We are a roofing contractor in Denver. We specialize in commercial roofing, particularly re-roofing and roof repair. We're a successful company and handle federal contracts as part of our normal business. We provide excellent value in customer service, but lose out on a great deal of business due to the lack of a clear, defined woman-owned business procurement program and an emphasis from Washington to fulfill the guidelines that are set. The SBA, in my experience, does nothing to encourage federal buying from women-owned business, but only from existing formal set-aside programs and vehemently discourages contracting officers in a variety of agencies from attempting to purchase from women-owned small business. Conversely, the SBA, in his own words, 
has a program whose mission is to level the playing field for women entrepreneurs still facing unique obstacles in the business world. The ambivalence found inside this taxpayer-sponsored agency is frustrating and unconscionable. Because there's no set-aside program for women owners and business in place, heavy pressure is continually applied in our construction field to purchase from contractors where a formal set-aside program is in place. This happens even when there are women-owned contractors available and eager to do the work. I've been thwarted in any and every attempt to encourage government buyers to do business with my company as a woman-owned business. I've questioned the individual buyers and purchasers with whom I have been working, and they've directed me to one reason for not following through with a woman-owned bid opportunity. The one common answer is the SBA is pressuring them to use only the existing formal programs. Consequently, the lack of a woman-owned set-aside program is a double-edged sword. There's no way for contracting officers to reach out and set aside competition between women-owned businesses, and there's obviously not a serious push from Washington to reach women business owners. The attitude towards bus women's businesses is <coughs> negative. There's no pressure coming down to the local level to outreach to women. The abundance of other set-asides without a specific program for women makes it difficult for women to get a fair opportunity to compete. Following are a few of my negative experiences in dealing with the SBA and government purchasing. I've made three different trips to the local SBA office to search for information and help in obtaining federal contracts. I was sent from person to person only to be repeatedly told unless I was undercapitalized and could qualify for an 8A program, I was beating my head against a wall. We were the successful bidder on a contract for indefinite quantity roof repairs at a Denver military base. Without a women's program in place, the SBA pushed the buyer to cancel the bid and to do their purchasing within another formal program. This resulted in the purchasing being bundled in with other contracts to hide their steps. We've been told many times bundling is a horrible approach in our field because the number of layers and people involved in communications essentially takes out the possibility of good emergency response to water leaks and infiltration. This is poor value for the government because a great deal of physical damage is done to valuable real estate and property while waiting through procedures required in the bundled contracts. I've had several meetings with the director of the Small Business Utilization Center at the Denver Federal Center. I've wanted to encourage buying based on a woman-owned small business status. While I receive courteous treatment, when I've gone back to the government buyers who say, they say that they were discouraged from pursuing women-owned business purchases by the very office set in place to help us because it doesn't help meet any formal percentages that are required. The new SBA proposal has unreasonable expectations and requirements, which are not included in other government set-aside programs. It's unrealistic and unfair to ask contracting officers of federal agencies to prove which industries have been discriminated against women. That statistical analysis has already been developed by the SBA. Several separate government-funded studies have been presented which identify over 2,300 types of businesses that are underutilized when it comes to women, yet only four have been outlined. Small business employs approximately 50% of the private sector workforce. We account for 60 to 80% of new jobs. A great deal of new technology and innovation comes from the small business community. Even though over 30% of the small business in the United States today is owned by women, only 3.4% of contracting dollars go to these businesses. Providing a strong set-aside program for women-owned small businesses will increase the number of excellent competitive contractors from which purchasing agents have the right to procure goods and services quickly and efficiently. This increases opportunities for women business owners, helps them gain a stronger foothold into federal contracting, makes sound economic sense, and provides far better value for the government as they continue to encourage small business to build and grow. Thank you, Ms. Gloss. Our next uh, witness is Ms. Pam Rubenstein, is the president and CEO of Allied Specialty Precision Headquarters in Indiana, an aerospace manufacturing firm. Mr. Ms. Rubenstein's company is one of the 0.1% of women-owned businesses in the manufacturing industry. Uh, welcome, and uh, you have five minutes.
Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Pam Rubenstein, and I'm the second generation owner and CEO of Allied Specialty Precision Incorporated in Indiana. My company was founded in 1954 and today has grown to 85 employees. We produce precision aerospace component parts serving the hydraulic, fuel control, and braking systems of every commercial and military aircraft that flies in the USA today. Since I bought my business in 2005, I'm proud to say that we've added a major customer, doubled sales, increased employment, and purchased five major machine tools. We've invested over one and a half million dollars in the last year alone in equipment and training. The advanced manufacturing business is expensive and competitive. And even with our strong effort, it's clear to me that implementing the Women's Federal Procurement Program would be a terrific boost to my company and employees. Direct federal contracts are very important to our growth and our movement into new industry sectors. The only industry we currently serve is aerospace. Right now, as you all know, aerospace is booming, and the outlook for the next 10 years is excellent. But all business, even advanced manufacturing, is cyclical. I need to begin to prepare for that eventual downturn in aerospace manufacturing now so that my employees and their families will be protected in the future. The Women's Federal Procurement Program would be an amazing asset in this endeavor. If the federal government is encouraged to seek out woman-owned manufacturers, I would see more potential work, could quote more, and find my way into other industries. Allied Specialty Precision Incorporated does not play on a level playing field. Unfortunately, many daily challenges arise, arise simply because I'm a woman. Business people, whether bankers, insurance brokers, tool salespeople, machinery brokers, even some of our customers, are shocked when they call or visit my shop. Many men are so taken aback at the fact that we're woman-owned that they can't look me in the eye during a conversation. We may be talking about my purchasing a half a million dollar machine, but they just can't get past my being female. Two years ago, I attended the International Manufacturing Technology Show in Chicago. It's a huge venue dedicated to showcasing the latest in machine tools, technology, software, etc., for advanced manufacturing plants. I had been to the tool show many times during my years at Allied, but this was the first time that I was there as a business owner. And I had a mission at that show. I was shopping for a five-axis si simultaneous mill, a very high-tech, specialized piece of equipment that I needed to manufacture manufacture parts for hydraulic pumps and aircraft. As you might imagine, most booths at the show were staffed with men, giving out information, answering questions, and writing quotes. As I entered the booths of manufacturers who offered such machines, most of the salesmen ignored me. One asked, what do you want? Another asked me whether my husband was out shopping since I was at the tool show. When I told them what I was looking for, their jaws dropped. But not one of those men apologized or offered me the information I was seeking. Obviously, they did not get my business or my money. Since that show, I've purchased two five-axis simultaneous mills from a company that took me seriously. Just yesterday, I had a telephone call from a customer who wants to come visit our shop. He ended the conversation by asking me to make his plane reservations between New York and South Bend, find him a hotel, and tell him how to get around town. He certainly would not have asked that of a male business owner. Needless to say, if he really comes to visit us, he will have made his own travel reservations. <laughs> so why does the SBA feel that advanced manufacturing businesses owned by women should not be one of the industries selected for the <coughs> women's procurement program? Not a day goes by that we don't have some issue over my gender. Obviously, those issues haven't shut us down, but they've certainly slowed our growth. My employees and their families deserve the best I can offer them, and I can offer them more if I can attract more work, especially from industries that are new to us. I ask the support of Congress to assure that the SBA amend the proposed rules for the implementation of the Women's Procurement Program 
to include manufacturing. We are ready to step up to new heights in business, and we hope Congress will act to support women business owners. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rubenstein. Uh, our next witness is Ms. Jennifer Brown. Uh, she's the Vice President and Legal Director of Legal Momentum. Founded in 1970, Legal Momentum is the oldest legal advocacy organization dedicated to advancing the rights of women and girls. <coughs> legal Momentum is a leader in establishing litigation and public policy strategies to secure equality and justice for women. Ms. Brown, you are welcome and have five minutes. Good morning, distinguished members of the House Committee on Small Business. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Velasquez, for inviting me to speak here today. And thank you as well, Ranking Member Shabbat. Uh, I have been the legal director at Legal Mo Momentum for five years, and I'm very happy uh, to have the opportunity to contribute today to your consideration of the Small Business Administration's proposed rule for implementing the Women's Procurement Program. I can summarize my testimony very briefly, but of course I will go on for five minutes. The SBA <laughs> has correctly named intermediate scrutiny or heightened scrutiny as the constitutional standard that the Women's Procurement Program must meet. And the program as Congress created it meets that standard. It is substantially related to the important governmental objective of redressing and ending discrimination against women-owned businesses. The SBA's proposed rule, however, would require federal agencies to make a public finding that the particular agency had discriminated against small women-owned businesses in particular areas of, uh, in particular industries, in their own procurement practices before they could let a single contract under this program. Uh, this is an emperor has no clothes moment. The SBA's requirement is frankly <coughs> preposterous. It has no basis in law and would doom this program. I used to represent the federal government against discrimination claims as an assistant United States attorney in the Southern District of New York. And I can assure you, no federal agency will ever voluntarily make a finding that it has discriminated in its contracting practices. It's absurd. The proposed rule would guarantee that no woman-owned business would ever benefit from this program. It's an insult to the Congress that created the program, and it's an, an insult to women like those on the panel today who own small businesses and are the driving force behind economic growth that this country needs. Congress created the Women's Procurement Program against a background of persistent discriminatory barriers faced by women-owned small businesses in government contracting. And amid evidence of the federal government's continuing failure to award even a mere 5% of its contracting procurement dollars to these businesses, despite the goal that was set to do so in 1994. And my written testimony details some of the evidence that Congress has had available to it over the years of discrimination against women business owners. There can be no doubt that the program meets the Constitution's requirement that it serve a substantial government objective. The Constitution also uh, requires that gender conscious means like the women's procurement program be substantially related to the achievement of their objectives. Congress met this requirement by limiting the availability of the program to small women owned businesses in exactly those industries where they are underrepresented in federal procurement contracting. This type of limitation is exactly what courts look to for when they assess the scope of affirmative action programs. The SBA's proposed rule would go far beyond constitutional requirements into unrecognizable territory. It would impose an unprecedented and entirely unwarranted condition on a well-crafted program by actually barring any federal agency from letting a single contract under it without first making, quote, and I quote this from uh, the federal, the introduction to the federal rule uh, as submitted by the SBA, a finding of discrimination by that agency in that particular industry. As I said, this is truly remarkable. What agency would ever announce to the world that it had documented its own history of sex discrimination in awarding contracts? I can only imagine the rush to the courthouse the next day by disappointed contract bidders, a rush that would be fully justified. Of course, there's no precedent for such an absurd requirement, nor any constitutional justification. 
To the contrary, the Supreme Court flatly rejected the position that the SBA is taking here, that the government may take affirmative measures only to address its own discrimination. The court dealt with that forthrightly in the landmark Croson decision. Now, the Croson decision for the first time required strict scrutiny of a race-based uh, federal affirmative action or state affirmative action program. Uh, it was a ruling that drastically reduced the scope of affirmative action programs. And yet in that ruling, the Supreme Court said the government has, quote, a compelling interest in assuring that public dollars drawn from the tax contributions of all citizens do not serve to finance the evil of private prejudice. And that was nearly 20 years ago. Courts evaluating sex conscious measures to enlarge opportunity have held explicitly and over and over again, as was noted this morning, uh, that it is perfectly acceptable for such remedies to address societal rather than governmental discrimination against women. As lawyers who work to advance the rights of women and girls, we at Legal Momentum are frankly astonished by the SBA's actions here. After so many years of stalling, the agency has finally promulgated a rule to implement the Women's Procurement Program only to include what can only be called a poison pill. Far from finally fulfilling its duty to implement this congressionally man uh, authorized program, the SBA's proposed rule would render it a nullity. And if I could just very briefly, I do want to flag for the committee the issue which is not addressed in my written testimony, but I would urge you to get further uh, expert advice on the methodology of the RAND study, um, in particular the, the, uh, the way that the dollar value disparity uh, measure is calculated. Uh, it says that if government spending uh, for women-owned businesses, small women-owned businesses in proportion of all spending in the industry is proportionate to not the number of women-owned businesses in that area, but the dollar value of those businesses in comparison to the dollar value of all businesses in the industry, then you have parity. That means that small businesses are always going to be a very small fragment of the total dollar value of businesses in their fields, or most often they will be. So very small amounts of government spending will produce, will always produce parity uh, when you're using that kind of measure. It's not how many dollars did we spend on women-owned businesses compared to how, what percentage of the companies in the field are women-owned businesses. Um, so I, I would, as I said, I, I'm not an expert in the area, but I would really urge you to get another look at that. It is not the way that most disparity studies are done, um, and it definitely bears further scrutiny from you. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you, Ms. Brown. <clears throat> uh, I would like to address my first uh, questions to you. Would you say, Ms. Brown, that this regulation is more in accordance with uh, strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny? Um, I would say it's an unrecognizable standard. Contrary to Ms. Papez's uh, testimony this morning, there is no case in the country that has held that an individual federal agency administering a government-wide program has to make findings of its own to begin with, much less an admission that it, it has discriminated in the past. So it is that whether you're talking about a race-based affirmative action program or a gender-based affirmative action program, that just comes out of nowhere. Basically, you are stating that the representation made by DOJ this morning uh, is incorrect. Absolutely. It is not recognizable as intermediate scrutiny. It's not even recognizable as strict scrutiny. Has the Supreme Court ruled that strict scrutiny should be applied in a situation compatible to this? Uh, no. The Supreme Court is very clear that, that heightened scrutiny is the standard for gender-based scrutiny. We are a women's rights organization. We like to see government measures that, dis that dis differentiate on the basis of gender scrutinized very carefully. Um, the Supreme Court has adopted the heightened scrutiny standard for that. It has spelled it out in different ways, but the substantial relation to an important governmental objective is the standard, and this program clearly meets that. How would you... Um respond to Ms. Popes' testimony that the agencies must show past discrimination to meet the intermediate standard? Well, I think that Ms. Popes was uh, skating on, on two different lines with all due respect. Um, first of all, 
when she said that, that court decisions require the government and then she inserted here the agency mm -hmm. to show past discrimination, what she's ignoring and what that analysis ignores, not to personalize it, is that Congress, Congress speaks for the government here. Congress has had testimony before it for years about discrimination against women-owned businesses. And as I mentioned, some of that is, is detailed in my, t in my written testimony. Congress made the decision that there is uh, a governmental objective here, and that is what would be tested, not an individual agency's finding. And then she goes beyond that. Uh, most of her remarks uh, focused on agencies having to show there's discrimination, discrimination in the industry. Well, that's exactly what the disparity study did. That was an important part of, uh, that was an important, uh, very useful thing that was built into the statute to require a disparity study. So you know that your remedies are focused on the industries where you have a proven disparity. Yes. But, but there's no, but she goes even beyond that to say you, you also need an admission of discrimination by the agency. And the Supreme Court is actually, in the Croson de decision itself, said, no, you don't. <laughs> Are you familiar with the case cited in the regulation Engineering Contractors Association of South Florida versus Metropolitan Day County? Yes, I am. Do you think that this case justifies the SBA's requirement of individual agency determinations of discrimination? Uh, absolutely not, and again, I would say on two levels. First, um, let's take that. That's a case where a county has an affirmative action program for women-owned business enterprises. Nothing, if the equivalent to the federal government on the county level would be, uh, excuse me, the equivalent to an agency by agency finding would be if the court had said, where's the Department of Buildings? Where's the school construction authority? Where's the hospital, the health department that lets construction dollars. They never suggested for a moment that each agency of that county would have to show discrimination. Never for a moment. And that is the, that's where, um, where the Department of Justice analysis would lead us. But besides that, the reason that the, um, that the women-owned business uh, provision was struck down in that case was that the disparity studies didn't show sufficient disparity. Well, that's no problem. We're talking about a program here that is targeted only, that can only be used if you already have disparity, uh, a disparity finding for the industry. So it wasn't that disparity findings were not enough. My testimony mentions multiple cases where courts, including the Supreme Court, have said disparity is prima facie evidence of discrimination. It was that in that case, the disparity studies showed results all over the place, up, down, all around. And the district court said that's not, that doesn't convince me, and the Court of Appeals said I can't say you're c clearly wrong. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, Ms. Rubinstein and Ms. Uh, Gloss, uh, a lot of the te testimony and question today has been regarding our concerns with the SBA's approach uh, to its proposed rule. The bottom line is without this program, the women's procurement program, women business owners will continue to be shut out of, a, of, feather, of government contracts. Less than 2% of women entrepreneurs are in construction and only 0.1% are in manufacturing, <coughs> both of which are represented today. Aside from implementing this program, how can we increase the rep representation of women in your industries, if you can offer uh, any uh, guidance. I would say an active role needs to be taken by the Small Business Administration to genuinely educate and encourage women business owners. I've been in the roofing industry myself for 32 years, experienced nothing but a negative approach or discouragement unless I was undercapitalized and couldn't essentially afford to run my business. High litigation business takes a large dollar amount to be able to cure a problem. They were not willing to help in any instance, anyway, unless I was an 8A contract. Women-owned business, they said nothing to them. Doesn't provide statistics, and without statistics, they aren't willing to put dollars behind it. That was all strictly in the local level. Ms. Rubinstein. For manufacturing, there are very few of us, <laughs> and in aerospace, 
probably Much less. a lot fewer. Um, it might be good to reach out to the trade associations, though. There are so many associations for manufacturers, fa manufacturing. I'm very active in the National Tooling and Machining Association. There are some women-owned businesses there. So going that way may help you identify those of us that are there. That's, a, that's the best I can say. Thank you. Ms. Forrest. Um, the SBA regulation lists only four industries where women are considered sufficiently underrepresented. Do you think that adding more industries to that list, consistent with the RAND studies finding, will make the program constitutionally questionable? Let me be sure I understand that question. In other words, if the SBA enlarges the four groups, yes. including the women cabinet makers, correct. Would the program be vulnerable to a legal challenge? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, no. As a matter of fact, my concern is that if the rule is implemented as currently written, the program will be subject to a legal challenge on several several bases. Number one, uh, when I say it creates a new standard, I'm, I'm very serious about this. There are currently three constitutional standards, rational basis, intermediate scrutiny, and strict scrutiny. There was a very good 1995 <laughs> internal memorandum from the Department of Justice right after the Adirond decision came out mm -hmm. that identified exactly what level of evidence is required before you implement these types of programs under a strict scrutiny standard. And I want to point out to the committee there was some very good language in that internal memorandum. Under a strict scrutiny standard of review, it says, number one, you don't delay the program until you do all these disparity studies. You only show that there is substantial evidence to make a prima facie case mm -hmm. of the need of the program. Number two, it says, and then what level of evidence is required, and it uses the language, not that level of evidence that rises to paradise. The SBA has basically suggested a rule that goes beyond paradise and lands at the foot of God. Uh, the third uh, point in that internal memorandum that I think is very, very good is uh, that it indicates that, and I think I know where Ms. Papez was coming from when she was saying you have to do an agency by agency mm -hmm. study. Croson was passed in 1989 and dealt with local remedial programs under strict scrutiny. Adirond was passed in 1995 in a series of cases that took that standard and applied it to the federal government. After Adirond came out in 1995, there was a flurry of internal governmental memorandums to the agency saying, what do we do now? How does this impact our program? And the memorandum was saying, let's buttress our facts by taking a look at our in internal practices. The big distinction is that all those remedial programs were already in place. You already had an MWBE program basically working. Uh, you had an 8A program working. In this instance, the, the women-owned set-aside is not in place yet. And so applying this strict scrutiny plus standard, which states you've got to have a disparity study, you have to have a study of the disparity study, and then you have to have an agency study of the disparity study that studied the disparity study. Uh, th that's where it goes into this new strict, strict scrutiny standard. I, I think that it is a slippery slope for the SBA and also a concern to all of the minority programs that are in existence because it's suggesting a new standard that essentially means no program will ever be implemented because the studies will never be completed. Thank you. Ms. Brown, do you believe that the program will be constitutional even if additional uh, industries were added? Well, you do need evidence that the, in oh, not need, but I think it's useful to have evidence that the particular um, are underrepresented in federal contracting. But the RAND study produces just four different ways to look at that question, and some of them have as many as 87 percent of underrepresented. Um, so, no, I don't think it would be subject to constitutional scrutiny or, or overturn, rather, um, simply tied through a different number. 
Thank you, Ms. Brown. And now I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Chabot. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Dorfman, I'll begin with you if I can. Um, without revealing any potential uh, attorney-client communications, is the uh, U.S. Women's Chamber of Commerce planning on taking any further action uh, in the federal court case? Um, we do have a status hearing coming up on January 28th. Um, it is my hope here today to once again uh, ask you all to um, take a look at what you can do to compel the SBA to do its job and implement the program. Uh, certainly uh, passing H.R. 1873, which has the language that is needed to uh, get a program in place for women-owned firms is a great start, and we're working with um, the Senate side to try and help them to make sure to get that through, but that may take some time. And I'm curious if there's not something uh, that Congress can do that deals with agencies that are, in fact, breaking the laws that they had passed and intended for implementation. So I'm, I'm passing it back to you to see if there's something here we can take further um, to compel the SBA to implement this program as intended by Congress when it was originally passed. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Goss, um, I'll move to you next if I can. Uh, you know approximately how many uh, women-owned roofing firms there are uh, in the Denver area, and uh, how does the SBA uh, discourage contracting officers uh, from buying from women-owned uh, small businesses, if, if you know or if you've heard? I'm aware of five women-owned roofing contractors, and they're all members of the National Roofing Contractor Association, so I am familiar with them. Um, in cases where I've been working with, since I've been in the industry for 30-plus years, I've gotten to know contracting officers throughout the federal government before many of the set-aside programs were even in place. We've done business successfully with them. Um, they've solicited bids from us actively. We've actively solicited work with the federal government. We enjoy them as a good buyer of ours. Over the past five to six years, contracting officers have come to me and talked to me about how can we better buy from you? How are we going to be able to continue to do business with us when the SBA pressure is so high to go to one of the other government set-aside programs? They say there's active discouragement doing business with a woman-owned firm versus doing business with an already set-aside formal program. And I have lost, I would say, about $2 million a year bids that are set aside to just one of those programs. Roofing is an easy thing for people to feel it doesn't take much talent to do. It's easy to shove it off onto someone that's a new business that doesn't have much experience. And that's exactly what the contracting officers that I've dealt with in the past have said. The pressure is so high from SBA to go with one of the other set aside programs that they no, have no dollars left to come and purchase. Okay, thank you. Um, what, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Rubenstein, what, what other uh, steps other than the implementation uh, of the Women's Procurement Program could the SBA, uh, in your opinion, or, or other federal, federal agencies take uh, to increase participation uh, by women uh, in federal government procurement programs? I'm really only familiar with my industry, and as I said, there are very few women in the industry. I think for me, the best thing that Congress can do is to implement the law as you originally intended it, and that would help me and my employees tremendously. Okay. Thank you. Are there any of the others who would like to take uh, Ms. Uh, Ferris? Yes, thank you. Um, I do a lot of work with minority and women-owned businesses, and, and I have a couple of thoughts on that. Um, first of all, I think it's critically important that this committee acknowledge that federal contracts use a unique type of delivery system called indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts. These are large, long-term contracts that typically have thousands of line items within them that might include parts, might include roofing, might include labor services, um, et cetera. You bid it on a fair market value times a markup or a discount. And so 
there are many, many small businesses out there that don't understand these IDIQ contracts or even how to bid them. My experience with the SBA has been that it's more of a come to us instead of let us come to you and actively recruit. There should be active region and local programs that are designed specifically to look at the local availability. Every major city in the United States has done its own internal disparity study that identifies minority and women-owned businesses within that city. There should be detailed training of the difference between a standard contract and an IDIQ contract. And I hate to admit my own stupidity, but I'm a lawyer that specializes in this area, and when I went through the CCR registration process, I had to stop and start over three or four different times because I wasn't quite understanding what they were looking for. Uh, the NAICS classifications are extremely difficult to be able to take your company and get it to fit in this little hole. For instance, I'm a law firm, but I also do education. I also do training. Uh, there are three or four different NAICS codes that I can register under. So all of these things are things that potentially are, are barriers to women within the, the federal contracting. And I think the fact that there's only 55,000 women currently registered in the CCR uh, should be of significant concern to the SBA and should be addressed immediately. Thank you very much. If, may I answer as yes, well? Thank sure. you. Um, first of all, when we met with uh, the U.S. Women's Chamber of Commerce, we met with all the agency heads and we said, how can we help you in, improve your goals here for women-owned firms? You're not meeting them. And they said, you have to get this law implemented. There is a, the other set-aside programs that there's a, a, an order they have to go through when we're at the very end, but they usually have to fulfill that. That means that women-owned firms are left to have to compete in full and open with the larger corporations, so we don't have that access. Um, um, when you get into um, the, the different programs that you were talking about, there's the procurement technical assistance centers out there to assist uh, small businesses in contra accessing that kind of information. Um, but what we see the SBA's whole focus should be on is implementing this program, not worrying about whether it will pass the court scrutiny because that's not their role. Their role is to get this implemented, let the court do their job, and help uh, women to access these contracts. We have hundreds, if not thousands, of women-owned firms who are not registered in CCR right now. Why not? Because th there's, this program has not been implemented. It's been a waste of time for them to do so. So you will not see more registrants in CCR until we get this program moving forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Brown, I've only got time for one more question. Do you want to take your shot at that one, or you want me to ask you an entirely different question? <laughs> ask me whatever you like. Okay, <laughs> very good. No, we'll get, we'll, we'll, please do ask me a different question. We'll give you a different question. Okay. <laughs> what data would you suggest that the SBA – uh, needs to examine to determine underrepresentation of women-owned small businesses in the federal contracting arena. Well, the the data of an underutilization uh, study, I think, is. Ms. Did Brown, you get the mic? Please yeah, get the mic okay. closer. Um, uh, I'm neither an economist nor a statistician. <laughs> um, as a lawyer, I can tell you that underutilization studies have been one court after the next has said this is excellent evidence of discrimination. So um, the the rep repeated refrain earlier today um, that you from Ms. Pepez that you need that plus something else is just not supported in the cases, um, no matter how many times she asserted that it was. Um, the, the thing that the um, underutilization analysis, that point I was making earlier about the, the dollar value measures is done by RAND, um, they basically accept that small businesses are going to get very, very small portions of federal f contract dollars. And as long as, and since the whole the problem with relying on that, it is a measure of underutilization, but the problem with relying on that is that it kind of freezes the status quo in place. Um, much of the impetus for having uh, special efforts made to invite small businesses, uh, minority-owned, women-owned, or just small businesses, period, 
um, into the contracting realm is based on the idea that that will help them grow, um, that they have been, that they've remained small because they've been shut out and that by coming in they'll be able to realize their economic potential. So a measure that kind of captures and reinforces the status quo as far as their size in relation to their industry as a whole is not going to help you make any progress on getting them to grow, which I think is the whole idea of these uh, programs in the first place. And that's why I would really, uh, I hope that the committee can get some additional expertise on that point. Um, I looked at, um, uh, and it, it, I think it's mentioned in my written testimony, there was a meta-analysis you know, of, of uh, maybe 60, something like that, disparity studies. It was undertaken by the Urban Institute under a contract contract with the Department of Justice um, that's, that's referenced in my, my testimony. And the, the normal disparity study, uh, as it was described there, they, they were looking at ones with different methods too, but it was taking not the number of contracts and the number of firms. I can see why that's no good. You could have a million tiny contracts that would look like disparity. It would mean nothing economically for the businesses. But it was the uh, percent of spending on that category of business compared to the, the, the number of those businesses in their industry. And I think that's a measure that many courts and statisticians and economists have been satisfied for years. It would look to me like RAND could rerun the, the numbers it already collected under that analysis and, and see what the result was. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. I yield back my time. Thank you. Ms. Clark? This question is uh, from Ms. Dorfman, and it, it sort of is a follow-up to uh, the question that our ranking member uh, raised. And I want to say that after being in Congress for one year, I, I too am outraged and frustrated by the blatant disregard of the SBA for the law mandated by our colleagues in 2000. Can you provide this com committee today with any recent factual or legal background as to your association's next steps? And are you planning another lawsuit against the SBA? And if so, what would be the nature of your action? Well, this, um, as you know, is the number one issue that we are working on. And we will do whatever it takes to get this law implemented as originally intended by Congress. Um, at this point, we do have the status hearing set for January 28th. We are here today again to ask, please help us to compel the SBA to implement the program as it was originally intended. Uh, the fact that uh, we've got um, the, the law that was very put in a very narrow scope, which is in total disregard for the NAS uh, study, uh, it just shows that the SBA is, again, dragging its feet, and it's time to hold them accountable. And there certainly should be some remedy for Congress to be able to address an agency that is clearly breaking the law. We need to move forward to the next step, whatever it takes. Well, let me just uh, say to, to all of you, thank you so much for, for coming and for testifying and for making it real, particularly um, from the legal perspective, from the practical application. Um, I, I'm just astounded. Um, as, as our chairwoman is, has been that, again, it's, it's been seven years. And I raise that. I keep saying seven years, and I think we all do. But for me, being a freshman who realizes that at the end of this year, we, we're entering into a, a whole new administration, it just indicates to us that this administration has done nothing, nothing to advance you know, the ability for women-owned businesses to, to participate in, in billions of dollars that are being spent annually by our nation, dollars that, quite frankly, you all contribute to, right, as women in our economy. And so, um, you know, I am standing very close to our chairwoman, who I know uh, is going to pursue this. But uh, quite frankly, I just don't see it happening. Um, under this administration, if they have done this for seven years uh, and, and they have not been able to close the deal with the American people and women in particular to make sure that they are equal participants in our economy and the things that we do, I don't hold out a whole lot of hope that it's going to happen before this administration leaves. Uh, having said that, I yield back the rest of my time, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Mr. Gonzalez. 
Thank you very much, Madam uh, Chairwoman. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think uh, my colleague, uh, Congressman Gomer, had indicated he had been a judge, and I also had the great privilege of being a judge. And after listening to the testimony uh, by Miss, and now um, I don't want to mispronounce it again, Elizabeth Papez, and then listening to the testimony of Miss Brown and Miss Ferris, then I understand the need for judges. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, it really is interesting. Because the basic proposition, and first let me start, uh, the, uh, the different hurdles that uh, have to be overcome just to, to give this particular program, uh, which has been legislated by Congress, and I think Ms. Brown points out, we see that there's a problem, we would like to see it addressed, we pass the ball off to the appropriate agency, our department, and then we hope, hopefully they will follow through. I don't think that's been the case. But I do not believe that Mrs. Papez came here today to misrepresent anything or uh, represent anything to this committee in bad faith. She could be wrong. In her opinion, it is not an open legal question. Yet her interpretation of the same cases is 180 degrees from that which we've heard from this particular panel, the, the two attorneys, Ms. Brown and Ms. Ferris. In her testimony, Written testimony, Ms. Papez states, the Justice Department's position on gender-based set-aside programs reflects these cases and the simple lesson they offer federal entities considering such programs. If those entities which must establish and administer gender-based set-asides in a constitutional manner wish to maximize the chances that a particular program will survive constitutional scrutiny, it is both legally appropriate and legally prudent to require evidence of discrimination before implementing the program. Now, I think the chairwoman specifically asked that question. I, I'm not sure I, that Ms. Papez really looked at her own written testimony because she didn't basically just stand by those couple of sentences. But let's just say it is an open legal question. Let's just say it's out there. And there is a prudent judge somewhere out there who's going to rule on this and try to give meaning to the legislative intent of Congress, which if I recall, that's one of those guiding principles and separation of, of, uh, of the three branches of government and with the duties of each and every one of them. The problem that I see, to be real honest with you, and those that are here from SBA and from DOJ, I don't mind you going back and telling people. My problem is that the argument advanced by Ms. Brown and Ms. Ferris to the objective observer would be the argument that would support and promote the program. The argument advanced today by DOJ and the representative Elizabeth Papez, you would expect to hear from the opponent. No one has to do the work for the government on this one. It's over. It's over because the position they've taken defeats it. That's my problem. That has been my problem with many representatives from different departments and agencies. We're dead from the, I mean, we just, from the get-go, we're not going anywhere. All I'm saying to the agencies, the department, to DOJ, we're not asking you to misconstrue or lie to a court. But if I have Ms. Brown and Ms. Ferris that can knowledgeably look at the same cases and come to this other conclusion, why can't you advance the same legal argument to promote that which we're trying to accomplish as members of Congress? That's the real question. After all this is said and done today, but it doesn't look like we're going to get anywhere. I'm not sure what we do. You know, we have a new attorney general who knows. Uh, all sorts of things could happen in the coming months. But it really is frustrating. I do have, and uh, you know, that, that's a speech and that's a statement, but when it's all said and done, it really is. Who's your advocate? This is the government attorney. This is the government attorney that's giving advice and guidance to agencies. Now, to, let's just say, you start off with the RAN information, and all of us up here know all about statistics and studies and such, and we can do all sorts of things with them, and they've already placed a huge hurdle. I'm not sure <laughs> if Ms. Gloss's enterprise is going to come under those, that is, those uh, enterprises, product services, that where there's an easily identified disparity. I think Ms. Rubenstein might, maybe not, we don't know, but a lot of people, the majority, the huge majority of women-owned businesses are not gonna fall under certain categories. That's number one. We're gonna have to deal with that. I don't know what we do about it. 
let's see if the comment period's extended, let's see if we get some good information out there and people will listen. But when we get into the legal, legal framework, I don't see that there is one change in given direction on how they're going to meet what DOJ believes are the legal standards. And that's going to be past discrimination. My question, and it goes back to what Ms. Brown says, I have never seen a government official, a civil servant, I, actually I've never seen it in the, uh, in, civil, in the civilian society either, someone come up and say, oh yeah, our practices are discriminatory. <laughs> oh yeah. Because you know what? There are consequences to that. <laughs> Why would you expose yourself to that? Confession is fine in the confessional. <laughs> this is just beyond belief. But what I want to know, let's just say we do have a good faith introspection by agencies and departments, and someone says, you know what, that appears to be discriminatory, might be found to be discriminatory, so we're changing it as of the, right now, right now. We're not going to do that anymore. Would that cure it? Because it's past discrimination, are we talking about ongoing discrimination? I, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out all sorts of ways to frustrate this whole program. Because we're going to come against the, I'm just saying, what are we talking about, past discrimination? present discrimination, ongoing discrimination, what is it that we're talking about? Either Ms. Brown or Ms. Ferris, or both. Well, we could look at what uh, DOJ or, or SBA in, in uh, response to DOJ has said, um, and I think it would be saying that the agency has to find that it has a history of discrimination. But I want to, I want to, address this one point. Um, the Adirond decision was the Supreme Court decision that for the first time said federal affirmative action programs also must uh, meet the strict scrutiny standard if they're uh, using race conscious measures um, by implication intermediate scrutiny if they're using uh, gender conscious measures. Now the Adirond decision, um, Adirond went back on remand to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. And the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals examined the record of discrimination. They didn't examine the Department of Transportation's record of, of discrimination, and that's the Department of the Federal Government that was carrying out the program. They examined what Congress had before it. How did Congress come to the conclusion that, uh, that this race-conscious program was necessary to redress discrimination? And again, I just have to emphasize, there is no court that has said that the government can act only to redress its own discriminatory actions. Um, it has said time and again that participating in existing discriminatory uh, practices is enough, and in the gender context, it has said over and over again that societal discrimination is enough. Um, so both, I, I, I do not, I do not believe, with all due respect, that there is a good faith basis in the, st in the cases for requiring an agency by agency examination of discrimination, nor do I think there's a good faith basis for requiring an agency determination that it itself has discriminated uh, in order to implement a congressionally enacted program. Thank you, Ms. Ferris. And, and one other note, um, if you examine again, as I did, um, the testimony submitted for the Department of Justice by Ms. Popez, um, you will not find cases cited to support those propositions, and that is a, a very glaring omission when you're talking about a lawyer's testimony. Testimony. Ms. Ferris. Uh, thank you. I, I uh, want to be sure your your question again is: um, Do the programs require remediation of past discrimination, or? are they more forward-looking? And the case law, again, and I want to clarify, when I refer to case law, I'm referring to the top law of the land, United States Supreme Court decisions. The case law indicates that, that the programs are remedial in nature. They are designed to remedy past discrimination, but they are also forward-looking because it defines discrimination as those patterns and practices which have created barriers to a certain class of people that don't exist for other classes of people. So in answer to your question, the programs are both backwards and forward looking. Um, I also wanted to pick up on a point that you made that, that I think uh, is very important, and that is that there is a fundamental lack of logic to the SBA's entire argument. 
that argument is that they have to do all of these studies to be sure that they have enough justification to withstand a legal challenge. Well, we're missing the fact that there will never be a legal challenge because there's no darn program in place to challenge <laughs> and never will be. So, you know, I, I feel like sometimes we're out there doing battle with smoke and mirrors when it's, it's not complicated. Um, Member Gonzalez, you correctly pointed out, A, there is not a single Supreme Court decision identifying intermediate scrutiny that has the word disparity study and, and narrowly tailored in it. it. It's a different standard. The only case law, the only case in the entire universe of case law out there that the DOJ is building their argument on is, is one decision that even within the decision talks about you being able to use societal, societal discrimination as, as proof. In my mind, there is no reason that the SBA cannot immediately implement this program. Um, I want to address one other question, and that was, do we have to do another disparity study? No. The proof has already been made through the disparity between the number of women-owned businesses and the ones that are currently competing in the CCR. But even taking it a step farther, if you want a disparity study, you have one with the RAND Corporation. Now, is it perfect? No. But, but you all look at statistics all the time, and have you ever seen a perfect statistical study? What the study did was it identified in a very forthcoming manner the flaws within its own study. And it said, here's the four methodologies we were given. And you have one that's way out here, and you have one that's way out here, and you have two that are in the middle. I'm not a statistician either, but I do remember a course that I took, and isn't there a concept that you throw out the top and you throw out the bottom and you look what's left to be somewhat average or representative? They're, they're really, uh, uh, again, going to what Ms. Dorfman said, there is no administrative or legal justification for failure to immediately implement this program at a 5 percent level. Thank you very much. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you for Expired. your patience. Uh, Ms. Brown. If strict scrutiny is applied to gender-based programs like this one, what will that mean for the 8A and other SBA uh, develop business development programs? I have to say I don't know the 8A program, so I can't answer. I, I would like yes, to answer sure. that. It, it should be a matter of extreme concern to any members of a minority or ethnic-based mm -hmm. group because what it is basically doing, again, is it is creating a strict scrutiny plus standard that if it is applying to gender-based programs, it's only a matter of time, the writing is on the wall, that it will trickle down not only to every program within the federal, but also to every program at the state, county, and local level. Extremely concerning. Thank you. And as you can see, there is so much concern about the proposed rule. Um, based on the testimony provided here by all the witnesses, uh, I just can't help myself but conclude that is, uh, the proposed rule goes far beyond congressional intent. And it is my intent uh, to submit uh, comments uh, to the proposed rule to the SBA. And um, in basically stating the fact that what I feel they are doing, the bottom line regarding the proposed rule, is this to destroy the program. It's just to make it such difficult that it will never be implemented. And if we are going to apply uh, past discrimination, I just would like to find the one agency, including SBA, <laughs> that will come out and say that, yes, in the past, we have uh, committed discrimination against women business owners. Given, they, uh, given all these facts and uh, the testimony presented today, both by SBA and the Department of Justice, and the fine uh, second panel of witnesses that we have with us uh, this afternoon, I would strongly suggest to the Small Business Administration that they must scrap the proposed rule and go back to the drawing board. With that, I ask unanimous consent that members will have five days to submit a statement 
and supporting materials for the record without objection, so order. This hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you very much.